coronavirus special. Nothing special about it. Myself and Ollie weren't able to record or uh, the fourth instalment of Hey Emily and Populism this week. Uh, and so we decided, I decided to uh, go and um, extract Stephen Hughes, Dr. Stephen Hughes from his hauntological expeditions off in the, um, not, not, not on the earth realm, uh, whatever hauntology is supposed to be about, uh, because he wrote a press release about coronavirus. Why are you writing press releases about coronavirus? Uh, I think the main reason is because being in the social sciences and studying science communication and studying the interface of science and society, I felt that we should have something to contribute to the conversation because this is like an event. It's a big thing that's happening. It's one of the most, I don't know, I don't want to say important because that makes it sound like as if it's being valued in some way, but it's like just a lot is happening. Um, and I kind of was just feeling like science, the sciences are contributing so much uh, and people are looking to scientists for all of the answers. And I felt that I think we might have something to contribute. And if we don't, we may as well just literally shut up shop. Because if we don't have anything to say, apart from picking over the bones of what happened for the next 30 years, which I'm sure, I don't know, 30 years of PhDs are going to be funded looking at this, what went wrong and, you know, what kind of uh, injustices were perpetrated during this. If we're not able to do anything right now while it's actually happening, um, I'm really worried about the relevance of our of our field. So that's why I thought I would write. And it was just one kind of press release specific to uh, RT News in Ireland. And it was based around asking this question, why are different governments responding differently if the science is universal because science is just science? So I started about trying to answer that question. So that's kind of why I did it. Um, what, uh, when you're saying we, are you saying social sciences or are you uh, referring to something more specific? Yeah, all of it, I guess. Um, I think that humanities and social sciences should because this is a, a lot of this is about politics. A lot of this is about the lessons we've learned from history it's to do with geography, space. Uh, it's to do with philosophy, morals and ethics. Uh, and it's about people living in societies, having relationships with other people within specific cultures. So all of the information and insight that we've built up over so many years in these various different disciplines I would like to think have something valuable to contribute at a time when all of these societies are in turmoil. And rather than just turning to behavioral science to try and understand this, I think I would have liked to think that we get a kind of more nuanced or richer understanding of what's actually happening um, and how we can do things like look after and care for vulnerable people rather than just imagining them as abstract data points and some sort of statistical mess. Excellent. Before we continue, though, of course, we've got to say what you are not. Right. So my area that I study one might make you think that I'm in some way involved in science, but I'm not a scientist. So that's one thing I'm certainly not. Um, and I'm certainly not an expert uh, in public health, uh, virology, uh, political science. My area of expertise is very, very narrow, like anyone when you've actually studied something for so long. Um, I'm also not a historian. I'm not really an anthropologist. Um, so, yeah, there's lots of things that I'm not. I mean, I think I think that that sort of question is is important or not important, but uh, pertinent because considering considering the sort of the the, the desperate um, vacuum of guidance, uh, it's just desperately necessary for people 
uh, to know wh- where the, their information is coming from and why that information is being delivered. I suppose uh, I think that I think your first answer actually sort of outlined why, um, despite not being an expert in what we're generally being told is the forefront of knowledge delivery, uh, science and policy uh, and economics. Um, it's still, like you said, desperately important to have. Um, well, you, I suppose you were emphasising the um, the importance for your field to have something to say that's relevant, but also um, also there's value to society. I mean, it, the field exists, uh, has stood the test of time uh, for a reason because um, it's quite likely that it does have something valuable to say. And uh, um, I know you said your expertise. The, the, the focus is narrow but um t- t- just a little bit further on your expertise um would it be would it be right in saying that despite its narrow focus that focus sort of sets its gaze on all of those other fields as such like you're, you're drawing in anthropology or history or science and um, i think your specific one is science science communication would that be a good way of yeah yeah um, so yeah, just just, uh, just for, for, from you, just elaborate on that expertise. Why should we listen to you? Um, yeah, so if we just take science communication, um, science communication, public engagement with science, it's really looking at that, like I was saying, that interface between science and society. And that interface happens in many, many different ways, in many different locations at many different times. Um, it could be you know, a science museum, it could be advertising for a particular technology, it could be the development of new innovations and new pro- products, uh, it could be the proliferation of technologies within a society. So in one way, the field is anywhere science, technology, engineering interfaces with society. So that's potentially everywhere, really. Same way that if you study economics, you could be looking at any aspect of the market. Um, but more narrowly, I think there's a kind of political impetus within the study of public engagement that looks at, you know, science communication not really just being about communicating scientific information, but in understanding all of these different sites that science and technology are rubbing up against or touching up against, and that in all of these encounters we need to consider what's what's really going on here so whether that is you know uh the history of a particular medical practice whether that is um the use of a technology within a particular culture whether that is um you know how can we think ethically about the future of new innovations so yeah we're kind of thinking about all of these other uh issues that science and society kind of bring to mind so we do need to kind of take a in some in some ways like a kind of broad brush approach of taking into consideration all these different things um and i don't know i don't know um if if you feel it's um uh relevant or possible to do it in a sort of concise and (laughs) concise and general way concise being brief general being sort of um without getting sort of too Mm -hmm. geeky or whatever what's what's the sort of your personal um framework what's what what informs your perspective are you talking about my specific the things that i study specifically or the field in general um no no yours specifically so if what in in your what like what direction i mean i know i know you're talking about the field but what direction are you um i suppose analyzing what's happening so i look i look at like public responses to new innovations um and i look at how publics emotionally respond to new innovations and what that says about agency what that says about uh relations of power relations of injustice and fairness and how we might use that information to think about doing things in a better way. So taking all of the amazing things that science can do and all the amazing achievements we can make, but actually directing them and aligning them with societal needs. 
what um what's happening here what's happening in the uk it, it, in that interface the uh with the virus with the scientists with the advice and with the policies what's your understanding so like one of the biggest mistakes i think that science in general makes scientists make the public's understanding of science makes is that like scientists have knowledge as if it's this you know all-encompassing thing and all we ever have are narrow strands of knowledge you know we never ever ever get a comprehensive picture of anything because it's exists in so many dimensions uh and in so many complex ways that are constantly shifting and changing through time so we get these like strands of understanding and yeah they're like really reliable those strands and you know the more work we do on them the, the clearer the picture it is that they give us but in the absence of having a more coherent picture a more more coherent sense of what's happening uh that's when the kind of the politics the defaults the uh emotional responses kind of guide what's happening so if you take the uk which is a broadly neoliberal uh nation which expects its citizens to kind of do all of the governing and um, it's no surprise that the science that's listened to by the government is science like behavioral science which expects you know uh, all of these data points uh, on the streets are going to react in certain ways like herds like we you know we hear this term herd immunity um or um in some kind of big you know homogenous congealed mass will do this thing or they'll do that thing um but it's still imagining each of these individuals to uh to kind of take control over things <laughs> yeah let me close the window yeah they're coming for you man there's delivery drivers going everywhere that's the uh the uh, the uk police with the new powers yeah the attack detain you for two years i actually got a really um annoying email from delivery i don't know if you saw it on twitter but up on twitter and it was like uh, a message from our founder uh the number one thing the number one priority for us is your safety and our riders safety and our restaurant safety so we want to make sure that when we're delivering food to you hygiene is the number one priority but did you know we also deliver household products and kitchen products? Yes. So that, hang on, hang on though. Did they say? I think because uh, I did see it, and I think it mm-hmm. didn't mention the riders or the restaurants' safety. I think it just mentioned the consumers' safety. It's the thing they said in the first, the first paragraph. That was oh, the paragraph. first paragraph. Just like from halfway through it. Oh, okay. But only because Twitter just allows you to have small little slivers of pictures. That's a shame. Um, <laughs> So it would have been funny otherwise. Sorry, where were you? You were talking about... Oh, yeah, so this herd immunity idea. And, like, the idea is that we're all some big kind of, you know, homogenous mass of individual data points swirling around in this thing. Um, and that the government have very little to do. So that's the kind of the neoliberal thing. But there's also this other kind of, I don't know, it seems to me, and I'm, I wouldn't be as well up on this because I've only been living here a short time, but there's the whole kind of like keep calm and carry on uh, sort of mentality, which is obviously the kind of World War Two, but then in kind of uh, post 9-11 terrorist response, and possibly through the kind of IRA terrorist response as well, has been the kind of like, you know, we'll just continue on and nothing is going to uh, stop us. Stiff upper lip. The stiff upper lip, yeah. Which is, which is possibly World War One or the, uh, the 19th century? So nice, yeah. or style you know it's more traditional and uh, yeah so there's this is sort of a, a culture about that that i mean hold on though is is that um because obviously neoliberalism doesn't stretch that far back is there is there a, a continuation or a reliance on the um adoption of both of them in the policy now uh so is is, is there a sort of sorry yeah rephrase that is there a cultural um film that this policy is relying on within British society or would it seem to be the case I mean, that makes sense I mean this is the thing where we're just speculating you know and we're 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 thinking about this but like 
one of the really important insights that I want to make is that, you know, it's okay to follow the government's instructions and do the kind of pragmatic thing, right? This is what we need to do to safeguard people. And I'm not an epidemiologist, so I don't know what the best thing to do is. But it's also okay to reflect on that and to reflect on other sources of information. So we see other kind of grassroots movements where people are saying, you know, why don't you put a a note in all of the letterboxes on your street and, you know, have like a WhatsApp group and say, you know, this is my number. If you're self-isolating or if you're older and you're vulnerable, um, we're here to help. So there's all of this other stuff that's going on that's not coming from the top down, um, that's offering, uh, you know, other types of ways of reading the situation. Yeah. So we can kind of do the, the kind of biopolitical population level, uh, you know, governance type of stuff. We can also look to other types of, of behaving and responding to the situation. Um, you mentioned other sources there, um, and obviously that that sort of that grassroots action being one. But is there other? Are there other state level sources that we can look at to 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 read this situation? Yeah, but I think fundamentally, I think once you get to the population level and you're thinking about the population level, it's hard to understand that outside of the kind of frames like the data point frames of reference. So. I just don't think we have the capacity. We certainly don't within the humanities to really understand like population levels. Like all of our frames of reference come from the the emergence of the, the nation state, which was you know all about borders and uh, defense and conflict. So our entire ways of understanding populations and nation level stuff is always in that kind of uh, you know us versus them, inclusion, exclusion, xenophobic, kind of saturated modes of thinking. And I think that the best ways we do have for, you know, responding at that level are just to be like, we need to be guided by the science there. And I think that that's absolutely fine. And like, if I'm in the UK, I will follow the UK government guidelines. If I'm in Ireland, I'll follow the Irish guidelines. Because I do think that the level of pragmatism that they're working at is completely adequate. And I do think that, you know, I don't know enough to question the decisions that are being made at the UK, you know, scientific advice level and the European scientific advice level and the US scientific advice level. But I do see that there is politics, you know, getting in there. I mean, you'd want to be in the meetings to know to what extent this is like neoliberalism, to what extent this is we can't have the shops closing, to what extent this is we're going to pull together and no matter what happens, we're going to get through this. Well, if we were to sort of attempt to uh, make inferences towards such, I mean, what, what at least on the, on the apparent level is like, I I think I read three countries, two other, other than Ireland that are literally around the UK that are, are quite distinct and, um, Norway and Denmark being the other two, like, um, what what what's behind the contrast speculatively or first of all do do you have an understanding of what that contrast is yeah i mean like th- there's a stark contrast between the kind of the public health um uh understanding of what's happening and the public health uh prediction of how best to uh, mitigate. So this is really painful kind of reality that's involved in this, that, you know, an enormous number of people are going to die as a result of this, like enormous, no matter what we do, no matter what we do, an enormous amount of people are going to die. And that's the the really terrifying part about that. Then we have to start making these decisions about, you know, how are we going to save people? And you know, what's the best way to do that? And who are we going to have to sacrifice to do that? And that's going to get, like, that's when things are going to go completely insane. Mm -hmm. So right now, there's two main approaches. And it's it's pretty much 
the Irish and the English one, and then in lots of different countries they're they're kind of doing that in the different ways. But the, the British one is the belief that if we allow this is the herd immunity idea, if we allow healthy people to just get the virus, to get sick and then recover and build up their immunity, they'll effectively create a shield against the vulnerable people when this inevitable kind of second wave happens. So when the kind of containment measures are relaxed, there's going to potentially be the second surge in the virus traveling around. But if the second time this surge is going to happen, everyone's already kind of got it and they're immune to it now. They're not going to be yeah. coughing and sneezing and spreading it around the place. Um, those who are vulnerable will be protected. The Irish perspective is that you don't know that in your first kind of let everyone get it phase, while you try to block you know, care homes and people in hospitals and have people isolate when they are sick, you don't know if that's going to be enough to protect people um those vulnerable people in the first place so you could end up sacrificing them in order to uh potentially save imaginary people in the future that you aren't even sure if it's going to work or not um so what ireland's doing instead is they're going pretty much the lockdown route so right now for this immediate time we're going to try and just stop the virus as much as we possibly can but the criticism of that one which is also kind of fair is that but well, you can't just stay on lockdown forever. So when you stop lockdown, the virus is just going to explode again. Mm-hmm. So you've kind of got this, no one really knows what they're going to do right now. So it's basically like hitting pause on society. Yeah. So they're going to hit pause. And some people are genuinely saying like, this could, this pause could be indefinite until they get a vaccine. This pause yeah you know indefinite until they figure out something better than these two other options so stopping economies stopping uh supply chains stopping travel is you know the kind of the pause thing but the the one good sign is that china did that but china did it way earlier like way way earlier we when we see uh, when we see the eighty thousand figure in china when, yeah, we, go for it. when we see that 80,000 figure in China, we think, oh my God, it's spiraled out of control there. But in the context of China's actual population and how tiny and localized that 80,000 people actually is, like they were getting 400 cases. It was when they were at the case time of getting 400 cases a day that they like literally like the shutters came down and the entire place was properly quarantined. But they have a completely different political system where people will go, okay, and all of the media and the internet is controlled by the state so they can just basically all of the messages everywhere instantly are like this and that population are used to that kind of authoritarian dictation so they are do what they're told Mm -hmm. whereas what happened in italy was they were well past the 400 cases a day and they basically said holy shit the north of the country is completely overrun um we need to quarantine the whole country that got leaked and so everyone from the north went fuck this uh flu got planes like got trains everywhere and then infected yeah everywhere so that's why europe is now the new epicenter and we're always about 10 days behind the true figure so our figures for what we have now are usually 10 days late um they're usually 10 days uh behind what the actual true numbers are so that's why they're saying that both the us and europe unless we literally just do the full lockdown that china did are going to be we're going to be in like a hell of a lot of trouble and even if we do do that we still don't know what the outcome is going to be because china did it so much earlier yeah the um i mean is there even a hope of without that sort of preconditioning of um, the relationship between uh, the population and the state, is there a hope of, of attaining that level of lockdown in Europe? Well, like I was saying in Ireland, they are looking to, to do lockdown, like proper lockdown 
shops, restaurants, businesses closed, you know, all unnecessary travel, like public transport is still going, but all unnecessary travel is curtailed. I don't know if they're gonna to get to the like military levels of China, where it's literally like, you know, the, the, the army is stopping people from moving out of the cities and stuff. But I don't see them having any other choice. And this is where it gets really interesting when we think about politics, because we see how governance is absolutely and utterly necessary and how the kind of illusion of individuals and the illusion of, uh, you know, rational decision makers as individual consumers completely just disappears. Like I saw a really brilliant uh, screenshot of uh, Niran Shapiro, what's his name? Ben Shapiro. Ben Shapiro. Finally begging the government for aid. He basically goes, where are all these tests and when will they be uh, like widely available? And it's all re- response basically just said, oh, when the market decides, Ben. Yeah. 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 Good, Which was good, just good libertarian that he is. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I think emo- emotionally, anyone that I've spoke to in Ireland, they're just like, there's 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 an enormous capacity and um um willingness uh anticipatory willingness for um for that lockdown for schools and, and uh, like schools um lockdown the schools uh, close the schools over in the uk has been trending for for days there's, people are sort of seem to be dying for that um i i, I suppose the shout from the uk government is that like you pointed out, well, while that effect might impact the situation now, in a half a year's time, once the weather becomes more prime for at least cold and flu, uh, time again, will, will, will people be bothered? But um, but again, t- just speaking to people in Ireland, it's just they, they just seem shocked that uh, that this that this doesn't look like it's on the cards over here in the UK. Um, is there um is there a not is there but what what's the what's the sort of cost benefit if you know what i mean and this might be sort of stretching your expertise a little but i mean it relates back to the decision that a government takes in terms of listening to the different perspectives that science might bring but what is the sort of cost benefit distinction between say um going into lockdown or using the herd mentality um, approach, a herd immunity approach, sorry. Well, th- that's where they're using the behavioral science theory um, that there's this thing supposedly called uh, something fatigue where people just get tired of washing their hands and social distancing and, you know, not going to the pub and gatherings and stuff. And they just, go back to doing that stuff and the UK government supposedly are buying into this theory that they need to do it at the right time otherwise people will kind of fall into the boy who cried wolf type of thing Mm -hmm. and they believe that the cost benefit would be the cost would be far greater because people would when it is at its worst people will stop doing the things they need to be doing the most and it'll you know exponentially increase things whereas if they hold off on, um, you know, really pushing it until the, the point where they believe it's most necessary, um, they'll be able to kind of control uh, how people behave, but not, this is, this, this is the thing where it's like the most insidious is the neoliberal idea is that individuals are rationals, rational beings who can choose. So what you're doing is you're kind of laying out uh, a stage where that's supposedly the thing, but you're actually pulling the strings because you believe in this behavioral science where you can control these through nudges or through whatever it is, advertising the usual, you can actually 
control the preferences and the choices of all of these individual actors. So that's where I think is it's most insidious is that really they believe, oh yeah, everyone's going to be doing these things, but we're going to control it through yeah. the piece of information at the right time, through the closing of schools at the right times. So rather than you being like together in all of this, like the way the Irish government are like, they are literally like taking a really good leadership approach where they're like, we're going to do whatever it takes uh, and we're in this together and we're going to get through this together. Whereas here, you've got this God complex governance where you're controlling all of these people um, and you're going to like say when they do the right thing at the right time. Um, yeah. It's a peculiar take on on individual freedom, isn't it? It's uh, we we we're going to assume this um this very atomized um uh, network of of well atomic free uh, points, and uh, we're just going to sort of like you know like ripple effect, like nudge yeah. this idea of nudge, and down the line we we hope they'll just ricochet into the shape. Of behavior that we we expect uh, whereas yeah i don't know something sits far far um far more sort of um right with me it, with the idea that uh that, that the hunkering down together thing is like okay listen guys yeah sure we've got we've got science and everything but uh we don't know we don't know what's going to happen and we're as scared as you but uh but we we are in the seat of power and we are going to do what we we're going to use that how we can um to try to do this together are you with us that that direct communication i, I mean it just seems uh, just a little bit more transparent and a little bit more democratic um and again this this the, the sort of emotional appeal and talking to people from ireland it's just this this idea that well they're just aghast that the, the schools aren't going to close that's the sort of that's the the catch-all at the moment um because in, like in one you're trusting people and you're saying we're taking a leadership position here and we're going to close these schools and you're bringing people on board with you whereas in the uk you're pretending that the people are doing what they want to do they're going about their daily life but you're still uh withholding that power and there's like a brilliant meme going around where boris johnson is doing his you know like many of our loved ones will die then it cuts to Lord Farquaad from Shrek going, millions will die, but it's the sacrifice <laughs> I'm willing to take. And it's just Perfect. so good because that's exactly it. It's like the agency is not being shared. Like when you do the lockdown thing, people are taking ownership over really because they're saying, right, we're withholding civic life and that's our contribution. Mm -hmm. Whereas here, people are you know not withholding civic life but they don't have that choice they can't just not do it because yep. they won't get paid or whatever will happen so yeah the um yeah it's it's um i know someone who uh was there they're in social care and they're not they're not on the front line um they're in the communications department but uh they were taken into a meeting and they were told that everyone uh in the in the organization was classified there was three tiers of risk that they that they were um, that they were exposed to in terms of in terms of family life. So I, I assume, um, well, I guess the hardest hit would be the furthest away from the proposal that this meeting was getting towards, which was okay. So the least the least exposed, the least vulnerable of our staff will be asked to pick up the slack in terms of um, helping. Uh, the vulnerable in our society with the, whoever whoever what's up sorry was that is that boomers asking for equality and <laughs> justice now um i'm not gonna oh, <laughs> let's I not go down that line it's so, fair, so it's vulnerability at a like a legitimate level yeah exactly yeah they, they could be any age um but um it's so that it's right there okay so the um in lieu of the government taking this moment um to address society in terms of um solidarity in the community on the ground yes there's going to be vulnerable people yeah so i mean whatever Boris is saying about those millions uh, not millions but the, the people dying that that is going to happen and we, we are going to need uh, solidarity in terms of our in terms of labor through this we can't just 
hide in our houses. However, the big distinction is, and this is where the government seems to be choosing not to step in, is the solidarity at the other end in terms of income. Mm-hmm. Um, it's still competitive. It's st- they still that variable to be there is still s- set in competitive mode, and I think that's that's just not only is 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 it on the face of it like oh god this is going to be really difficult i i I desperately need to help people uh because they need help but how am i gonna if i get ill by exposing myself to the increased uh, the increased um risk how am i going to handle that down the line um but also you you're just not forming that bond that that sort of that together together bond that seems to be occurring elsewhere um that we are actually in this together and um i think i was going to hold i was going to hold that until late till near the end in the chat because it um it feeds into the idea of um the whereas we we began with the political distinction at state level the political distinction uh, at the um at the social level being in the UK to me feels like I'm in a bit of a a basket case country because um, because the countries around us are doing something different. And um, through what you've said, the, these political dis- the, um, decisions based on different aspects or different shades that the scientific community can offer. Um, that those decisions that those decisions are being made if if we can't if they're like you said at the very start if we if there is no if science isn't this isn't an ultimate truth isn't a window into a sort of reality a very solid clear picture of what's going on then how how can what processes are these decisions arriving at? And like, yeah, of course, we've been discussing, I mean, Ireland isn't exactly exempt from neoliberalism. Um, wh- how is it that these decisions are being made? Or, or how, how, sorry, how can we access that process, that decision-making process? Like, how do we make sense of it? So if I'm looking around at Ireland, um, at the Scandinavian countries, um i mean of course spain is going to go into lockdown and italy because they're so they have so little choice but there's still the illusion of choice for other countries to to go one way or the other i'm looking at i'm looking outside at these different decisions and it's just I, I, yeah like i said i feel like i'm in a sort of a basket case situation um and i kind of want out do you know what i mean um so to bring it back to this, uh, to the classification, the, the the solidarity, the expectations of solidarity in our labour, but the the total void of solidarity in our income and the welfare uh, down the line. How how are people supposed to feel about that in the UK? Have you got any take on that? And that's the really weird part, is I haven't been seeing much of a reflection of what is the public sentiment right now? What is the public's... I mean, if you take something like Brexit, it's all public response. It's just interview after interview after interview with people going, you know, whatever their opinion is. Mm -hmm. But it's it's like the full focus is on the authority, the expertise. And, I mean, you kind of have to do that. You know, you absolutely have to, but at the same time, you're not. It's a bit peculiar. You're not getting any sense of what life is actually like, what people are thinking, who is being affected, um, who is this disproportionately affecting? Like, it's it's almost like as if no one <coughs> has has got this like disease, and yet everyone has. Because like I've never seen like someone talking about it. I've seen the the odd Twitter posts, but the experiences of people with it, the individuals, mm-hmm. the people on the ground, is completely and utterly you know missing. It's it's absolutely you know the scientists, the 
uh, authority figures, the, the government, um, and then this kind of imagined mass of people. But as we always know, when, when people in the lead positions imagine people, yeah. they tend to get it wrong. And they tend to, along the old fault lines, you know, class, class racism, uh, the, yeah, these people tend to, you know, be forgotten about because we're, the people who are imagining are imagining it in their own image. Mm-hmm. So, no doubt over the next 10, 20 years, all of that stuff is going to come out. But how do we get that out now? To a point, to a point that doesn't compromise the really, really important, you know, pragmatic risk communication stuff. Like you need a, a clear message, you need an authoritative message, you need a trustworthy message, you know, like all of that stuff I fully as, like ascribe to. And I'm like, yeah, absolutely, we need that. And, you know, I'm still willing to, even though, like, I'm, you know, critical of the UK response. I'm still going to do what they're saying because I actually believe in the scientific advisors who are advising Johnson and whoever else. But how do we match that with this, you know, really like important need to reflect on how this is actually impacting people on the ground? I think it's a, a sort of a, a contractual thing. Like I remember someone, um, I, this sort of the argument just to bring it to a, a similar level issue but an, an entirely different one um with uh, with refugees from Syria crisis yeah, just that that horrible typical disgusting question like oh well why aren't you just taking them into your house um and i think i think with that the, i mean the answer to that is it's it's like an issue of first mover and it's an issue of knowing what's appropriate um well, yeah, of course, I'd, I'd love to take them into my house, and but I'd be terrified because there's no protections. Anything could happen. I don't know who the hell they are and blah, blah, blah. Um, at the state level, I, I would imagine as soon as it was, it was a sort of, it, if the approach was, okay, everyone, let's all make this space, that's the first moving point. So it's not it's not expected to be on the ground. The first mover isn't on the ground, so the risk is taken by the state to go. Okay, we'll, we'll like we'll, please do this, everyone. Like making that appeal, and that there will be protections there. That the that you you then on the ground with your house and your spare room, you know that the state is that the authorities are looking at this situation and that they're aware and they expect you to do this. So. Um, you feel a lot more comfortable doing it relating back to this um the sort of the the first mover risk in the uk i feel that this whole last week was like what is the appropriate behavior here um i'm sending my kid to nursery uh, i'm going i'm traveling to different cities by train and and different towns by bus um i'm feeling quite awkward about it nobody around me is saying we shouldn't do this and then all of a sudden, I suppose this weekend things have ratcheted up, and there is a bit more noise. But still, um, you know, the, the schools aren't closing. <laughs> There's still that openness. There's, I, I feel a little bit more certain about what I need to do, and I'm going to work from home, and I'm going to keep my kid out of um, nursery. But I'm paying for that. I mean, not the work thing, but the again, the kid. I'm paying for the nursery, but he's he's uh, he's not going. And um, yeah, it's it's that sort of first mover risk thing uh, about defining what the appropriate response is, and it would just be a, a, like a hell of a lot more certain if the um, if the government was sort of a bit more clear on that. And I think that was what is missing alongside what I was talking about with the um, the competitive solidarity module. And if you get those two things together, that's 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 what I I, I feel is the sort of is the like I said, there, like a, it's there's a contract, there's an agreement. There's like, okay, I'm willing to take s- risks because I know you expect me to. You acknowledge it, and you will be seeking to, sorry, you'll be seeking to sort of ensure that whatever mm-hmm. um, vulnerability I experience from this, uh, you you will sort of carry. You 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 you'll um, look after. Um, and where I was going with that was, um. Because that doesn't exist, yet we are expected to take those risks. 
and I already asked how people ought to feel about that. What 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 could people be doing about that? And I like I mean I just think of the that three tier classification of risk in this organization, and I just like my instant reaction is like oh god how dare you? Like but at the same time what well, we're talking about helping vulnerable people, so that absolutely has to happen. But it's got nothing to do with the organization because they're helping um, mm-hmm. vulnerable people. So what's the X factor here? Like what, who am I supposed to be angry with? Mm-hmm. And of course it's the, uh, it's that lack, it's that lack of contract at the state yeah. level. It's the shape, isn't it? It's the shape of politics. That's, that is the absolute problem. Governance. It's, yeah. It's the, it's the shape and the, the, the framework of governance that is allowing this to happen. And when it's the framework, there's no one to blame because it's all of us. We're all, this is the shape of, of neoliberalism is that we're all. I get you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we're all making these choices. Um, and like, I, th- I think we need to think because we, like the crash in 2008, we're offered a choice because the mask is slipping. And how is the mask slipping? The mask is slipping because, well, one, we know that society can be radically reorganized within a matter of weeks. So anyone that talks about communism, it's not possible. How long would it take? Oh, there'd need to be a war for it to happen. All <laughs> of this stuff. No, education, trade, economics, healthcare, civic life can all be radically changed within a matter of days. Not even weeks, in a matter of days. And people can be willing to do it instantly. So, you know, and it could be guided by ideas about protection of vulnerable people, protection of lives. Like, it can be guided by changing the world for the better. Mm-hmm. So anyone that's thought about stuff being too idealistic or utopian, like, you know... Uh, not Expecting this to continue is utopian. Yeah, but like... But people saying like, oh, Bernie Sanders, that's utopian to believe that. It's like, well, look what's just after happening here. We're talking about like we've moved into full authoritarian communism. You know, well, Ireland has moved into full authoritarian communism <laughs> from, you know, center liberalism. Yeah. But it's like everyone and everyone's been like, yeah, let's do it because this is the, it, right, yeah. it's the right thing to do. So I think like we need to like take a, a hold of that and take a grip of that and leverage that as much as we possibly can that things can radically change and the economy the economy like (laughs) last week everyone was like the shares are tumbling the stocks are tumbling now everyone's like who gives a fuck what's tumbling we need to close everything and no one's saying except for boris johnson yeah uh but that's because he knows what a weak position the uk is in because of brexit and so like my fear and again this is speculation my my fear is that he's literally the scab the global scab where everyone else is going right coronavirus we have to stop working and he's going to be the global scab that goes let's continue working guys we'll make a fucking packet so this this is what i was trying to get at actually with the uh the cost benefit uh earlier um why why is ireland in a position with with its miserable tax base why is Ireland in the position to fucking actually pay for this and the UK isn't? Any thoughts beyond that? Like, beyond like either elab- continue elaborating at what you were saying or a- a- any wider ideas? Because I think this is bigger than I think this is bigger than the economy and I think it's bigger than the governance frameworks that we've had. And uh, is this for Ireland? You mean? Or? Yeah, and Ireland has historically always been able to think of itself in terms of the other, whether that's the UK, whether that's Europe, whether that's the US, it's been able to situate itself in a global context. Um, emigration, everything, like we've always been able to see ourselves in this global context. So we're humble in that way. So we can be like, let's just do what other people are doing because we, you know, we don't think we have all the answers. Yeah. And the UK has that level of arrogance where it can say, we're not going to follow the WHO rules. We're not going to follow what the rest of Europe are doing. Uh, we think we know better. And mm-hmm. we're Great Britain. So uh, by God, what it takes, you know, like 
I genuinely believe that the Conservatives, that Boris Johnson, has that level of megalomania where he thinks that, like, we can do the right thing even if everyone else is doing something else. And, like, the prick is probably going to end up being right or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, this this, this but, is like, the thing, I think, that what I fear is that... Um, sorry, you know, sorry, carry on. Taking on. that risk itself... Uh, like only arrogance i think can uh make sense of that i i equate i equate the psychology with this like running a gauntlet like it is high risk it's narrow as fuck you you're you're gonna take scrapes but as long as you as long as your belt's tight enough just -hmm. to bring it into the into the economic mindset we might just get through it and if we do we'll be far far stronger for it but it's not a gauntlet. These are human lives. You're not getting scraped. It's yeah. the bloody country. Yeah. And that's what's disgusting about it. And like yeah. you said, yeah, he, like he, like not, what? Not he could be right, but I yeah. feel he. Yeah. I interpret that as he could get through the end of this, and yeah. everywhere else has collapsed, yeah. uh, and Britain will be like, well, we've we don't have a pension problem anymore anyway. Yeah, absolutely. It's the gig economy workers, part time workers retail, hospitality workers, all of those, their lives will be decimated. The mortgages won't be paid. And, you know, he'll say, but look, we've got this booming economy because the city stayed open. We picked up everything that uh, everyone else dropped. Yeah. And they'll do what America did in the 50s and completely utterly exploit the kind of like the devastation of the, like what they did with the post-war. Wow. And the Johnston plan, yeah, or whatever other civil yeah. servant, Jesus. And but I mean, like that—that that is absolutely not a speculation. I have no idea. For all I know, Johnson is like doing exactly what the scientific advisors were saying, and the scientific advisors who were, you know, like inc- like incredibly accomplished, uh, like like you know, it's not just like. Johnson and like you know two scientific advisors like the, the Cobra team and all of the people and all the civil servants and stuff like like this is a massively institutional decision making machine. It's not just about one person's hubris, but you can't help but think that like what is allowing them to believe that they could be getting it right where everyone else is is doing something else. Yeah. So you, you, your, your fear also. Sorry, go on. That just just that takes some kind of fortitude, some sort of like self belief. Not, not only is there the gauntlet uh, scenario, but actually the idea that um, once the second wave hits, Britain will be far more prepared for it, whereas the other countries won't. Yeah, that'll be... <laughs> that, it's that'll a be... risk. Yeah. It is a risk that other countries are not willing to take. And I suppose that's why I diverted earlier to the... Uh, to the emotional side, I still feel, I still feel in this moment that, um, that if, if I was brought into work in the same way and, and given that classification and if I happened, if, it, if I eventually was whatever layer I was of reserve, uh, called to that front line, um, I wouldn't check from aiding more vulnerable people or vulnerable people more, yeah, more vulnerable than I, Mm-hmm. But I just feel like I would want to somehow take hold of the economy, the local economy, the national economy, whatever, whatever we can get, like in terms of paying taxes, in terms of almost demanding that we work for free. But, you know, um, as in I, like my, my impulse would be I will work, I will work and I'll do this. But I don't want to be I don't want to I don't want that to be the thing that I'm getting paid for. I want I want to just in this situation when when other institutions that I've been relying on up until now look like they're on the verge of collapse, I wanna be uh, I wanna know that um I can still sustain myself um mm-hmm. through other means. Mm-hmm. I don't I don't want to I don't want to work harder and get paid more. I don't want to work better and get paid more. I just want I'm happy to help people 
in fact, it's probably all that needs to be happening right now. Uh, certainly not fucking financialization. Um, well, whenever there's a like a correction to real economy, as in you know the real things that are people need and all that type of thing, you know all of the value that the billionaires millionaires are holding on to the imaginary value. They want that converted into real value, mm-hmm. and because because that doesn't actually exist, the financial kind of gambling stuff, the pretend value, because that doesn't actually exist. If they're to take the real goods, commodities, and turn that, you know, exchange that for their uh, like pretend value, that means everyone else has to go without because it's oh yeah like absolutely like it's ridiculous to think that like someone like Jeff Bezos actually owns that amount of resources in real things if he was to choose to cash in just basically go like well i want that but that's what happened in 2008 like you know like that's the thing yeah, absolutely like, absolutely and it's like uh when and it's, 1930 which is more yeah. pertinent yeah um and i think from the thing that you're outlining there like in order for that to happen like they'd have to forego their imaginary wealth and the real stuff that's being distributed and would, would be needed, even if it was like a limited, like a rationing kind of World War II type of thing. That would have to be just, we would all have to be able to know that that was going to be distributed fairly amongst mm-hmm. everyone. But it's like, because of the emergency in World War II and the rationing and all that type of thing, like it was that that allowed the, so, the, like the social welfare system and the NHS to, to develop. So I'm hoping that this well, not here in the UK, but obviously in Ireland and in, um, in other places are doing this. Like when the mask slips, they remember what society actually feels like. Yeah, I remember someone making um, pretty much that point on Twitter earlier. Um, the 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 social organisation and the centralisation of managing World War Two um, led to that to that infrastructure for social democracy that worked so well. Um, my response though was that uh, for that to be implemented post war, well yes, remember remember that infrastructure existed, but for it to continue was the uh, the leveraging of um, the working class being decimated and the the capital private capital being invested tied up in um, state and i just think if something similar is to come out of this i mean i really hope it's not a similar leveraging situation and assuming it isn't how do we synthesize that leverage how how do workers how do the vulnerable how do people who who are brave want to get out there um want to make sure as many people survive this as possible um how do they articulate that demand from, from I, the state? I think by us uh, making as real as we poss- as real and felt as we possibly can. When I said there that people remember what society feels like, I think that's mm. it. We, we need to make people feel and remember what society feels like. Like every time you hear about a story of like people putting those like notes in people's doors you get a shot of society yeah absolutely we need like artists who are sitting at home not working the people in gig economies who are not working like the people all of those precarious workers sicily singing at the window yeah academics that are not caught in the trap of capitalism where they don't have the energy time or means to contribute in any other way than to just live you know these people can now remind everyone and you know to create and to in culture and to make real and feel what society means so that when we're to return in whatever it's six weeks or six months time to that soulless like horror of fucking neoliberalism everyone's like what are you talking about we love each other we don't want to do that to each other like somehow if we can do that maybe absolutely um and that that's a beautiful point and uh, and that's an hour and that was a beautiful chat and thank you very much and uh, i think i think that should do it really thank you <laughs>